about it. Well, James, um, uh, we, we we come on air at the, at the moment that that um, it means a lot for Celtic fans. Um, when Paul announced the quadruple treble charity weekender, I was delighted to get involved. When Celtic went behind in penalties, I'll be honest, James, I was terrified because I thought. Right, he's called at the quadruple tre- treble charity weekend. If Celtic don't win this today and you and I have to come on air afterwards, it's going to be a tough shift. But Connor Hazard saving the penalties has made it a lot easier for us. Well, you know, we, we're professional to the, to the very end, so we'll always find a way. And um, yeah, please for Celtic, you know, such a massive club, you know, not just at home, but also abroad, you know, very highly respected here in the Netherlands as well. Um, as I touched on one of our podcasts in, in the past, I remember I remember when they came to Amsterdam for um, for the Europa League match in, I think it was September 2014. And um, I went to that match and it was a 2-2 draw, if my memory serves me rightly. And, um, and um, I was in the lower tier behind the goal. And I kid you not, I could hear the Celtic fans above me and not just a couple, literally all of them. They literally took over that stadium and they also, you know, marched from like the city centre to the main station and then all got the train down from uh, the, the central station to, um, to where the stadium is. And um, it's, it's not a big, it's not a long journey, it only takes about 15 minutes, not even that. But they literally took over the city that day. And, um, you know, I think they enjoyed coming for an away day. I remember when they came here in uh, in uh, in 2003 and they was, they was, I think they knocked Celtic out in the qualifying rounds of the Champions League Ajax. That was the, that was the start of my, my journey here, if you like, when they went on to qualify for the Champions League, come up against my club and two years later I move here. You know, it's uh, strange how, how things come together, really. It certainly is, and on this show, basically to, to introduce everyone to James, this is James Rowe. James is the the chief football writer for Football CFB. He also Hello. writes for the Secret Footballer. James has interviewed over three hundred um, players and managers. Um, his three hundredth publication will be coming up over the next few months into twenty twenty one. And just to start, James, um, just can you give the the listeners a wee bit of background about your interviews today and who you've got coming up? Well, first and foremost, just thank you very much for the kind words. And um, yeah, it's great to be part of Football CFB, first and foremost. Uh, fantastic overtures from the Secret Footballer as well. You know, fantastic reward for four and a half years of hard work. And for, for people that don't know me, my name is James Rowe. I'm originally from the UK. I emigrated to the Netherlands nearly 15 years ago now. I've just passed the 14 and a half year mark. And um, I started out interviewing Dutch players and managers here in the Netherlands, which took me to the likes of Venlo, Zwolle, Enschede. And then um, and then things kind of spiralled from there, where I, a different publisher called World Football Index came in for me. And before I knew it, I was it was interviewing the likes of Danny Cowley, Graham Potter, Ricky Van Rollerswinkel. I, I might add that I sourced all these interviews myself, which gave me an awful lot of confidence. And then... Um, as, uh, in August this year, I was approached by your good self if you'd, um, about publishing my interviews. And since um, since uh, my interviews have been published on Football CFB, it's just kind of um, gone up a notch even more. It's it's really interesting to to you know look back on a great body of work for the last four and a half years with everyone having a story to tell at all different levels, you know, and um, being able to interview Dutch players and managers in their mother tongue being able to interview in English and Spanish as well, and always looking for the human element of um, of footballers. You know, I remember when I spoke to John Heron, who also has a Celtic past, and we spoke uh, a couple of months ago about his time at Celtic, and, um, you know, always tailor-making the interviews. There's always something that you don't know, and people often ask me, Callum, what my favourite interview is, and I, I, it's a very difficult question to answer, and I try to tell people that, I don't have favourite interviews. I have watershed interviews, and they they are, you know, the likes of um, Bob Wilson, who's a, a legend of my club Arsenal. You know, um, uh, Danny Cowley, because it was the first one of note where you know it's very ambitious in terms of the request, and um, you know that and for him to ring me back, you know, this is a it was a busy um, a busy professional football manager at the time, but to give me the time of day. And then as well, the, the assistant chief executive of the PFA, Simon Barker, I think that one remains a standout one due to his standing in the game. 
you know, I hold uh, ambitions to hopefully work one day on the media side of a professional club. And I must say, since um, writing for Football CFB, you know, to have the likes of Bayern Munich, the English FA, the Dutch FA, Manchester United and Aston Villa view my LinkedIn profile, it gives me a lot of confidence. And I'm just hoping that um, hopefully when the corona kind of subsides, that um, a club is courageous enough to come in and say, right, James, we've seen enough now and uh, we'd like you to be part of our team. And in terms of uh, Celtic, I mean, you, you've interviewed some some former Celtic players. You mentioned John Heron, Adam Virgo is another. Um, what other Celtic uh, players have you managed to interview over the years? Well, actually, they're, they're the two that stick in the mind because they're the most recent, really. But obviously, to, to go back into an archive of 300, of course, you uh, you do forget a couple. But obviously, if I go back to, on, on John Ver- on John Heron, for example, and Adam Virgo, you know, they're both immensely proud to sign for the club. And it is, it is a massive club as well. I mean, if you think of the the history of the club and what the club represents. You know, I mean, I've never been to to Celtic Park before. I've, I've seen them play live twice, actually. I saw them in a, I think it was pre-season friendly against Ajax as well before the Europa League uh, match. And obviously they came up against my team in the Champions League as well. And just a, a massive, a massive gargantuan club, you know, and uh, everything that's about, everything about football club. I mean, I remember when I spoke to... Um, to Peter Grant as well, and that's another one that kind of stuck in the memory with a Celtic, uh, with a Celtic um, past. And he was talking about his, his his love for Celtic that he didn't want the time to end, and he wanted it to last forever. And he was saying about you know I think it was his his grandfather who would be the one that would kind of um, arrange buses for young school kids that were in and around Glasgow to go and watch Celtic play, and the effort involved in that. And I remember. I remember speaking to Peter, Peter Grant about his stint at Norwich as well, because I think it's important to, to say um, Peter Grant was, um, was good friends with Alex Ferguson. And when Peter Grant got the Norwich job, he received a phone call from Alex Ferguson. And he said, you know, it's a great job to have. Norwich are a great club. He said, but the location where it is and knowing how hard Peter Grant works in terms of scouting, in terms of, um, you know, going to scout players, looking at the youth players, you know, trying to get into the gym early to make sure there's enough exercise and, you know, keeping sound in body and mind. He said it's a very difficult job to have. And Peter Grant even said himself, you know, that it, there were such long days, you know, that at some t- at sometimes he, he hardly saw his family. But in terms of... Um, in terms of Celtic, he, he really did not want the time to end. Absolutely, and, and I'm just reading some of the comments there. So basically, uh, James and I are here, obviously, for um, the, this show, which is going to explore the Dutch connections at Celtic over the years. Um, an incredible, incredible uh, result today for Celtic. History in the making. I agree with the comments. It won't be seen again. Um, but we're, we're, as I say, we're here to talk about the Dutch connections. This is part of the, the charity weekend, of course, that we are desperate and happy to support. Um, first question, James, about the, the, the Dutch connection at Celtic. This is a big season where Celtic are going for 10 in a row. Um, the other side in Glasgow are going for 10 in a row in the 90s and we're stopped by Vim Janssen, a Dutchman. Um, just explain what the, the significance of, of Vim Janssen in uh, in, in, in Dutch football? Well, if I start off with um, his beloved Feyenoord, you know, to make over 400 appearances for Feyenoord, win the European Cup in, in 1970, you know, be part of that first Dutch side to win the European Cup, you know, and to make so many appearances like he did. And um, he also plays for Ajax, which is the huge rival, although he didn't play as many games for Ajax as he did for Feyenoord. But, you know, he was also a runner-up in the World Cups in 74 and 78. And uh, was part of that generation, along with Neskins, Klaus, Subir, you know, those those men, you know, that were not just fantastic footballers, but also fantastic camaraderie, both on and off the pits. So, you know, it's just like playing with your mates, but, you know, 30 years before before the, everybody else cottons on to it, you know, in terms of uh, defending space and playing together and working hard and also, you know, knocking out Arsenal and... Um, um, it was Ajax that knocked out Arsenal, but what I'm saying is, is that the, the camaraderie that those players had, particularly at international level, you know, and he was a huge part of that for the Netherlands. And then he's to, to come to Celtic as well, a massive club, 
and uh, to stop the 10 in a row happening. You know, he may have only been there one season, but it was a, a very big season for Celtic. And he, he's, he's looked upon with a lot of affection. You know, he, he was a fantastic servant for his country in particular. As I say, 400, um, 400 appearances in the final doesn't come too easy. You know, playing alongside Van Harnagam as well. So, um, yeah, he's a fantastic player and also a very, very good manager too. Absolutely, and it was an incredible season when when, when Celtic stopped 10 in a row. Um, history was made that day, just as history has been made today. Another person I really want to to talk to you about is Henrik Larsson. Now, Henrik Larsson is, of course, Swedish. He's, he's from Sweden, but he joined Celtic from Feyenoord. Yeah. What, what was it like when, um, what was the reaction to Henrik Larsson when he was playing in, in the Netherlands and be honest, James, when, when he arrives at Celtic, did, did you expect him to go on to have the career with the club that he had that he did? Because let's not forget, he was successful in the 94 World Cup with Sweden, so he didn't come as a complete unknown. No, and also the um, the transfer that, um, that Feyenoord paid for him, I think they paid the Swedish club, I think just under €300,000 at the time, I think, or €300,000, um, what it translates to is Euros in this day and age. But, um, you know, he won, two, he won two Dutch Cups for Feyenoord. You know, it's, it's no mean feat. And Feyenoord, together with PSV and Ajax, they are the traditional top three here in the Netherlands. And at the moment, you know, with Dick Advocat, you know, finish, finishing off his... Um, his last season, they lost today at Fitessa uh, and uh, a new manager for next season, Arne Slot, has already been announced. He was the um, manager who was recently sacked by Arsene Alakmar and uh, he's, now, um, he's now going to be managing final as of next season. But um, yeah, they, um, they highly respect him here because obviously Larsen, like myself, is also fluent in Dutch. And um, obviously... When you arrive in the Netherlands, you need time to adapt, and some people learn quicker than others. But I've also seen Henrik Henry Larsson in the past give interviews on, on Dutch TV, and he's exceptionally high quality. He is indeed, and, and he, he, he talks very fondly of his time at Celtic. I was, I was uh, fortunate to interview Henrik earlier this year, and he, he's still in love with the club now. And I, I can only imagine, although he's over in Barcelona today, he will be absolutely delighted. Now, there's a fair few comments coming in, James, obviously, about today. Celtic um, have won the quadruple treble. So let's spend some time talking about it. As I say, the comments are coming in thick and fast, as I can see here. We aren't intentionally ignoring it, I, I promise you. Um, it's just, as I say, we were booked in for this slot. But let's be honest, James, to, for, to win 12 the domestic trophies in a row is... Is a one hell of an achievement. I mean, mm. you think of your club uh, is, is, is Arsenal. Obviously, you were based in England before you moved to the Netherlands. Mm. Th- this is the equivalent of Arsenal winning the Premier League, the FA Cup, and the League Cup for four years on the trot. Mm. When I put it like that, James, just how incredible an achievement is this? And could it ever be done again? Because as I said to Paul just before you came on air. I don't think this will ever come again. I think this is such an achievement mm. that, as Martin O'Neill said on air on BBC today, I don't think this will be done even in 100 years' time. No, and I think he's absolutely right as well. And people are often quick to malign different countries and, and kind of say that it's only, it's only a two-horse race or you know things like that. But Rangers are also up and coming. You know, I think they'll have their time going forward. And the Gerrard's doing a very, very good job. Uh, but I think you have to respect every country, you know, as someone who's dealt with players and managers from all over the world in the last four and a half years. Um, professional el- elite sport at the highest level of a particular country must always be um, respected. And in the case of Celtic as well, you know, the, the pressure involved to play for such a club, people say, oh, it must be easy in Scotland. I, I disagree. It must be very difficult uh, to keep up the level of expectation at Celtic and Rangers in particular, you know, in terms of both clubs. But yeah, it's a great achievement, something that also needs to be celebrated, you know, even in these strange times, you know. My club is, is struggling in, in, the, um, in, in the Premier League. We look as if we're going to be um, pulled into a relegation fight and I, I find myself having to kind of untwist my tongue when I say that sentence but um, unfortunately due to the situation that Arsenal find themselves in and with the owner that we find ourselves in um, it wouldn't surprise me 
And um, I see a lot of um, discontent among the Arsenal fans. And, uh, you know, we are, you know, there's only two clubs you know, in, in English football bigger than Arsenal. And that's Manchester United and Liverpool. And um, we used to have such high standards, Callum, but they're slowly slipping away. And um, sad to see as a, as a fan who's I've supported the club for more than 30 years, you know, in, before COVID, I was touching on them. Um, before the COVID outbreak, I was touching on uh, 45 games from the Netherlands where I'm based, um, 45 Arsenal games since the 2011-2012 season. So I was looking forward to doing a half century, but uh, that would just have to be put on the back burner at the moment until things are safe. But um, yeah, fantastic achievement for Celtic, delighted for them. And I've also got to enjoy these moments. I mean, if I may, I remember... I remember going to Highbury before I um, before I left for the Netherlands and I was watching Arsenal play sumptuous football and I remember I was sitting in the East Stand that day and there was a voice shouting at the top of his lungs, we all need to enjoy this, we all need to take this in because we're never going to see this like again. And he was absolutely spot on. I mean, if you, you fast forward from 2004... Um, to the last match I, I actually saw at Highbury was Arsenal Celta Vigo before I came to the Netherlands. I had a year of not going to football and especially Arsenal matches. And don't ask me how I survived, but I did. And then I had obviously building a life up here. And uh, my first five years in this country, I didn't go to a single Arsenal match. And although I was very happy with life here and, you know, to have all the things you could only dream of, you know, a beautiful home and, and stable work and the ability to, to find, uh, to, to speak a foreign language, there, there was always part of me that when pe- when friends would see me on a Saturday, not every Saturday, but just every now and again, they'd see in my face that, you know, I wish I was there today. And that's why I was hell-bent on, you know, especially before the COVID outbreak, attending as many Arsenal games as I could, win, lose or draw, it doesn't matter. But um, I'm hoping I'll get to attend a few games at the end of the season because I, th- I think they might need me as well as as well as well other fans in the stadium, encourage them, encouraging them to hopefully um, avoid what is seemingly unthinkable or what was unthinkable. And in terms of the achievement today, James, as we've talked about and we've mentioned, it is, it is incredible, the, the, the piece of history today. I, I want to ask you about about a player that's at Arsenal at the moment. And the reason I want to ask you about this, Arsenal, as you say, are going through a t- really tough time at the moment. Do you think Kieran Tierney might be sitting down in London this evening and thinking, I, I just wish I'd stayed at Celtic to be part of this because he could have made history today. But mm. unfortunately, as uh, uh, for him, um, as, as as we say, Celtic are making history while he's on the end of another defeat. Yeah, I think part of him will will think that. You know, he's obviously had that terrible injury, you know, against West Ham, which kept him out for a long time. But you know, he's he's, he's endeared himself to the Arsenal fans. But Arsenal's problem, Callum. It starts with an owner who's completely disinterested, who only sees Arsenal as a safeguard of a long-term investment. We need a hands-on owner. We don't have that. You know, where you, you, you don't have two loves, as they say, but in the case of uh, Kroenke, his first love is LA Rams, not Arsenal. And I see a lot of Arsenal fans, you know, Overmars is leaving Ajax. They're thinking, oh, Overmars can come to Arsenal. It's not as simple as that. You know, Ajax play the same way from the from the young 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 players under nines all the way up into the first team. They play the same way, and the, the youth is the bli- is the lifeblood of the uh, of the club. And Overmars also did the same role at Go Ahead Eagles, and he did a really good job. Go Ahead Eagles are currently first division, but they'll be on their way back before too long, and they're very a very well respected club. And um, you know, he did that job at Go Ahead Eagles. Before he arrived at Ajax, so he knew what he was doing. But um, yeah, to go back to your point, I think Kieran Tierney will be thinking, you know, maybe I should have set, set, stayed at Celtic. But timing is everything in football, as we know, when speaking to players. You know, we, we've both spoken to, to players that a transfer has made their career and literally broken their career. And I think we've reached the stage now, especially in transfers, where what is the deciding factor? It's not necessarily the money. I think the deciding factor is, will this chance come round again? And if I don't take this chance, will I, will I be full of regret that, you know, the chance, can't, chance came and I didn't take it? But unfortunately, at the highest level, you know, the clubs are also being spammed by 
agents and uh, third parties where cl- cl- clubs are receiving impersonalised correspondence, hoping that a player will stick. And, you know, they're kind of... Um, you, you see how, in the case of um, Chelsea's transfer um, boss, Marina, how well she's doing. And I've heard firsthand from an agent I spoke to recently, Stephanie Molina, her inbox is always empty. She always answers her emails. And yes is yes and no means no. And she's very transparent. But fortunately, not all people are, are like that in football. But um, as you dig deep, you know, coming across players and managers, you know, you learn to understand these things. And I, I look at my club at the minute and I, I just I just think to myself, where does it all end? Because we don't have a United fan base neither. And normally, if, if you had a, a United fan base... Regardless of what's going on on, on on the pitch, you stick together. But we don't even have that. It's always about which fan has got the most clout. But I'm not being funny. Certain fans that think that way, if you prod them just a little bit, they don't know much. And I'm not being funny. In certain cases, they're not in the position that me and you are in. And I go back to... Um, to a fantastic phrase that uh, Jock Steen said to Alex Ferguson when uh, when they qualified for the World Cup, and unfortunately, unfortunately, he passed away shortly afterwards. But before the game, Ferg- um, Jock Steen was even saying to Ferguson, "Whatever happens, we must keep we must keep our dignity, we must keep our integrity." And I think that's a fantastic quote. And I, I just think, in terms of fan culture in this day and age, I think a lot of fans. I think they I think they forget that very quickly and, and that's quite sad in my opinion. It can be, but as you know, James, when, when passions run high, fans can say um, certain things and, and they won't change. We're seeing that even with Celtic at the moment with calls for uh, a change at board level or long term in the managerial hot seat. We've, we've got a comment in from Thomas Patrick Smith. Hello to you, Thomas. He's saying Christopher Iyer, who scored the winning pen today, um, when he scored, it showed how much it meant. Hopefully we can kick on now. Now, as, as we've talked about, James, today's a, a, a momentous day for Celtic. It's a momentous day for Scottish football and the history of the game up here. As we say, as we both agree, this will probably never be repeated. Do you think this could be a catalyst for Celtic and Neil Lennon to, to take the chase in the title race and try and claw back Steven Gerrard and his side in the next few weeks and months? Uh, potentially. I think it would depend what Rangers do in Europe. I mean, Rangers are playing a very underrated side in Antwerp. And, uh, you know, they uh, beat beat Tottenham, you know, and uh, came through a, a group with Linsk as well. It was, uh, and Luda Goretz, who'd been playing um, Champions League football not so long ago. So Antwerp have done particularly very well. It'll be interesting to see how far uh, Rangers actually go in Europe. I think that will also... Um, I think that will also play a part of what could happen, but also I think I think in it, you know so, sometimes things fall into place for a team, and you know I, I recently spoke to Kmar Roof for, for Football CFB, and he was saying that you know the people like Bielsa and people like Gerard, there's a method to the things they do. It's simply not lining up eleven against eleven and hoping for the best. It's you know there's a method. It's like a chess game really, and I, I think Gerard, I think. You know, the Rangers are obviously the big rival of uh, Celtic, but I think from a neutral point of view, like I am, um, I think that Rangers also need to be commended for taking the chance on Gerrard because it appears to be the the worst kept secret in football that as soon as Klopp moves on from from Liverpool, then there's only going to be one name in the frame. Well, it seems that way. And another comment that's that's come in um, there from from Peter... um, the, the atmosphere at games with uh, no fans, um, that's, a, that's a big talking point. I mean, mm-hmm. today, remember, was a Scottish Cup final and there was no fans at the game. Celtic are a club that have an incredible, an incredibly passionate fan base. At Celtic Park on a European evening, as many of the greats of the game have talked about, and Iesta, Messi and others, is, is, is an atmosphere to behold. Could it be said, James, that having no fans at games is affecting Celtic more than other sides, or is that too simplistic, do you feel? Uh, no, I think, obviously, to have that m- amount of people watching you, you know, and it, it must affect a player. And also, as well, for the for the players that play against Celtic and they, they get promoted and they get promoted from the Scottish First Division and they go or the Scottish Championship and they go to to play at Ibrox and they go to play at Celtic Park 
Yeah, it's a great feel for them as well. So I think opponents were also missing the fans, you know, the atmosphere that, that Celtic have. You know, as you say, the European nights, you know, Barcelona and Milan spring to mind, you know, and um, they uh, Celtic have also won the European Cup, which people mustn't forget. One of my pet hates, if you like, is people seemingly being... Um, forgetful about history you know Celtic have won the European Cup Hamburg have won the European Cup Aston Villa have won the European Cup Nottingham Forest have won the European Cup this is this is history and it must it mustn't be forgotten however long ago it was you must never ever forget it you must never forget history. I've actually I've got a picture behind me of the the, the Lisbon Lions um, there. In terms of that achievement, James, again, the the comments coming in are from Celtic fans. I myself am a Celtic fan, um, I, I, and for me, obviously, we we're caught up in the history because it's our club. For you as an outsider, when you think of the the story of '67 and the fact that the players um, came. Uh, from within 30 miles of Glasgow less than 30 miles of Glasgow that's something that will never ever be done again Absolutely and that's I think for all the good for all the good that Celtic represents I think that triumph you know I know society has changed I know football has changed but that particular triumph was just that will never ever be repeated again and you know the togetherness of that squad you know to go and do what they did you know it's, it's not easy and you know, in terms of the, um, you only had the champions going into uh, going into play in the European Cup. You know, to go into. I mean, I'd give my right arm for my team to win the European Cup. We lost the final when um, we lost the final in two thousand and six, and things could have been very different. But I think that Lisbon Lions um, achievement in particular, you know, it it transcends beyond football. You know, even people that don't that don't have no affiliation with Celtic, they can't help but respect such an achievement because it's uh, extremely unique and very special. It is, and one of the things that I think sums up the, the way Celtic fans react to to winning the European Cup is the fact that so many fans um, travel to the Estadio Nacional in Lisbon, and, and, and I was one of them. Um, I went there in 2019 in October, and I remember going going to the stadium and I remember thinking... Right, I'm going to the Estadio Nacional. It means a lot to me. Uh, my fiance was coming with me, and I said to her, "I went. There's going to be Celtic fans here at the stadium today. It's not just going to be us." And and she said to me, she said, "No chance. It's a it's a random it's a random Tuesday in October. There is there is no way that that there'll be there'll be lots of people here. Um, mm. Her interest in football is is." Um, is something that that is is is, is limited. She, she enjoys football, but not to the extent that I do. And as soon as we got to the stadium, we got out of the taxi, and sure enough, as we got towards pitch side, there was literally eight or ten Celtic fans there taking pictures of the plaque, walking up to where Big Billy McNeil lofted that trophy above his head, and 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 it was an incredible experience for me. It 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 was something totally totally unique because. You wouldn't get many fan bases in the world that would dedicate um, the place where they won the, the, the European Cup as, as a pilgrimage, and, and Celtic fans do that. Yeah, but that's good. That's that's a good thing. If anything, it's it's, it's what makes it special. And you, as I say, we are in it. We are in an industry where history is written every day. You know, a manager loses his job, a player breaks out, a player signs for a club, and you know, you see a lot of of hyperbole in this day and age, and the the, um, the tradition as well, you know, the tradition of of uh, respecting what's gone before. It's also something which is vitally important, and, and it should never be lost sight of, in my opinion. Absolutely, and uh, Philip DeMarco getting in touch to say history is what makes us today, and today is all about the twelfth trophy. Philip, I totally agree with you. Today is about the twelfth trophy. Today is about history for Celtic. It's about history in Scottish football. Um, it's an incredible achievement, and I'm sure your nerves were were shattered just as mine were when when the penalties were, were there. Um, Ninth Legion getting in touch there as well. It was it was an incredible incredible day for Celtic history is made every day, and it's something that 
that defines football clubs and it's all about going forward now and that's going to be the interesting thing for Celtic and just to stay on the aspect of of going of going forward I mean Jonathan Brown's just got in touch to say Europe is where we really get noticed Philip a lot of Celtic fans on the the comments today James have said performances in Europe haven't been good this season and a lot of people want to see a change in manager I'm not necessarily saying today I think an aspect of the fan base will but I think most people agree long term they want to see a, a, a managerial change. The big question, James, and I don't want to speculate over Neil Lennon's job um, for for uh, a long period of time because it's unfair on a day like this, but longer term, what sort of managers out there do you think would be would be, would be suitable for Celtic longer term? For me, I, I've been on record the saying that I think Eddie Howe uh, longer term would be a manager that would, would appeal to me at Celtic because like Brendan Rodgers when he arrived, I think he would bring a, a, an air of professionalism. He plays football the right way. He wants to play football on the ground. He wants to attack teams and that's what great Celtic teams have always had in their locker. From, from your perspective as an outsider, who do you think it would be a good fit for Celtic in the longer term? Well, it depends what direction they want to go in. If I just bring it back um, to the European um, escapades this this year, um, first and foremost, I think you have to respect the fact that it was in a very difficult group. Um, you know, Sparta, Prague, Milan and Lille, three very good sides, three very difficult away days. So there's no shame in not getting through that group, in my opinion. I think, you know, we live we live in a world, unfortunately, where some fans, if it's not Barcelona or Bayern Munich or Real Madrid, the rest must be pub teams. Sparta Prague, arguably the biggest uh, club in the Czech Republic. AC Milan no, needs no introduction. And Lille have made tremendous progress, both on and off the pitch in recent years. And if you compare that to Arsenal's group, you know, Dunn, Dork, Mulder and Rapid Vienna, we won all six games, but we... We should win. Uh, we should have won all six, and we did. But um, I don't expect Arsenal to win in Lisbon, and I don't expect Arsenal to win in London. So I think our adventure will come to a premature end, unfortunately. In terms of manager, it'll be interesting to see which candidates um, uh, are put forward. You know, we saw West Brom um, appoint Sam Allardyce. You know, and um, you know, I'd like to think that Celtic could be a bit more innovative. And there's so many, there's so many good young managers coming up you know you, you got to make a, a choice which is a little bit outside the box I, I'm, in terms of names I'm not I'm not entirely sure I don't really know who's in the running I think I think as well I think a club like Celtic you know to have a Scottish manager would also be would also be a good good idea you know because you're you got you think you're also safeguarding the, the national game. You know, you, you Scotland's qualified for their first major tournament in 22 years with a Scottish coach at the helm. And that's a fantastic advantage and that's a fantastic achievement. And I think if, if there are good, young, promising Scottish managers out there, then um, why not look to appoint someone from Scotland? And then you're you're building them up with the experience that if they do if they do well, it could in turn help the Scottish national team in future as well. It could, and I'm interested in the comments. Um, who do you think would be a long-term Celtic manager? Because I think if, if if you if you look at it today, it's Neil Lennon's day, uh, it's Celtic's day, and um, I, th- I think Neil Lennon will remain in charge at Celtic um, definitely now for the next few weeks at least. Um, but I'm interested to get your perspective, James. Um, I think this would be a good talking point for us at the moment, um, given that today is a, a history um a uh, day for Celtic. I think it's important to also look forward. Uh, Chris Strachan's got in touch with two names, Dan Petrescu and Slavin Bilic. All I would say, Chris, in regards to Dan Petrescu, I think he's just left his job. I don't think it was particularly going well towards the end for him before he left his post. Bilic, we know, was harshly treated. I mean, mm-hmm. drawing it at Manchester City and losing your job is is, is, is tough. Um, Stephen Coulthard saying that um, Dan Petrescu is a good shout. What do you make of those names, James? What's your opinion on Dan Petrescu and Slavin Bilic? Could, could they be potential longer-term, forward-thinking Celtic managers? Potentially, but I, I think I think Celtic. If if you look if you look at the at the promising Scottish managers, I think it would be a really really good PR move, and I think it would be a really really solid approach to look at the literally get the bet the best. A most qualified Scottish manager to manage the biggest club in Scotland. 
you know, it, it's not it's not rocket science, and I think it would take a lot of courage. But I mean, I, I go back to to when Unai, Unai Emery was um, was uh, unfairly sacked at Arsenal, and you know his team are you know fourth in La Liga, winning winning yet again in uh, in Pamplona yesterday away at Osasuna. Um, I was asked by many people including uh, speaking to Arsenal Fan TV at Carrow Road um, last, uh, last November after the match, who I wanted as uh, Unai Emery's replacement. And I said Chris Wilder. And I was literally lambasted by all and sundry. Oh, Chris Wilder, he's useless. He's not good enough for Arsenal. I was giving facts as to why I think he's good enough. And... Um, I was trying to say, you know, we're an English club, we're an English heritage. Why do we always have to look abroad? You know, why not get the, be- the best English manager at that time? And at that time, that was Chris Wilder. Obviously, his situation has changed. But I think, obviously, Bielic and Petrescu as well. I, I just think so it, w- w- it would be a courageous move to look to look inwards and see right who, who's the best Scottish manager who's the most capable Scottish manager who's capable of making this step up you say about Eddie Howe but is he enough of a winner I mean you have to remember this is um, even the Burnley fa- even the uh, Bournemouth fans sing on one of their chants you know that Eddie Howe went to Burnley and then he came back and they kind of chanted that you know he, he was homesick but Burnley at that time was a difficult job and if he struggled at Burnley then to take the biggest uh, the the biggest job in Scottish football, not having a track record of of winning anything, I think that could be very difficult from my point of view. In terms of a Scottish manager, James, in, in terms of your shout, um, Regan Steamson, uh, hello to Regan's getting in touch to say Jack Ross could be the up and coming manager. What I would say, Regan, in, in regards to Jack Ross being a potential Celtic manager. I don't think this is the the time for Jack Ross. I think he's rebuilding his reputation slightly following um, his his dismissal at Sunderland. Um, When you talk about Jack Ross as well, there's going to be a lot of pressure on him. For me, if he doesn't win the League Cup with Hibs, given the sides that are left in it, namely Livingston, St Mirren and St Johnson, I'm not saying he'll be under pressure at Hibs because he'll, he'll, he'll retain his job, but I don't think a manager who has done okay at Hibs um, long term we'll get the Celtic job now I can tell already that people in the comments will say well that was Neil Lennon etc well you could argue that second time around but obviously Neil's got his Celtic connection as we know next next one uh, next name on the list Jonathan Brown we should go we should have got Rafael Benitez before we went and got Neil Lennon could Celtic tempt Rafael Benitez back from China I don't think it's impossible, but um, I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, minute information in contracts regarding Chinese clubs. You know, primarily your wages being astronomical. You know, and um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that people are led by money, but uh, w- when you're offered eye-watering am- amounts of money then it, it could turn anybody's head. But uh, I just think that Celtic have to be um, proactive. I think it reminds me of what Craig Brown told me when, uh, obviously, um, he was assistant to Alex Ferguson at Scotland. And, uh, you know, Alex Ferguson, you know, there was there was overtures from Arsenal and Tottenham. And Alex Ferguson said, well, I've got a job to do at the World Cup. I'm not speaking to anybody until after the World Cup. And Craig Brown even said that at, at poolside, you know, poolside in Mexico, when they're on a bit of downtime and they're chilling out and relaxing, you know, so Alex has got kind of a look on his face when, you know, the Arsenal appointed George Graham, Tottenham, I think, appointed David Pleat. And he kind of had a look upon his face of, you know, oh, maybe my chance is gone. And then apparently Martin Edwards spoke to Gordon Strachan and he said to Gordon Strachan, he said, uh, he said, what about that Scottish manager who you had at Aberdeen? And he, uh, Gordon Strachan's reply was, if you want uh, a life of peace and quiet, then leave him alone. If you want a stick of, you want to put a stick of dynamite through your football club and you want him to bring success to your football club, then get him down to Manchester as soon as possible. And the rest, they say, is history. 
And, you know, we, we're in a position speaking to professional players and managers all, almost every day at all different levels of world football. And I hope to go on to be part of a football club on the media sense. But one thing I would love to do in the future is that all that experience that's been built up the last four and a half years of dealing with technical directors, players, managers, chairmen, agents, referees, you name it. You know, all that experience that you bring, that you have, you know, when you're at a football club, you've got a responsibility to make the right decision. It's not a, um, it's not a, um, a choice that you make lightly. You're dealing with something which is exceptionally important to the local community that the, the football club find it, finds itself in. So the people at board level, they have a massive responsibility to make the right decision. And that doesn't have to be taken in the blink of an eye. And especially with the way things are these days and age, it, you know, to, to make the decision which maybe isn't very popular. But you've got to stand by them. And, and managers also need time. I mean, uh, Unai Emery received 18 months at Arsenal. And look at Arsenal now. We're a shambles. I mean, if we, if Unai Emery was still in charge of Arsenal, we wouldn't be in the position we're in. But unfortunately, Arsenal have a fan base, uh, particularly a young fan base. Not every Arsenal fan. Just, you know, at the moment, obviously... All fans have the good and bad, but Arsenal, young, particularly the younger fan base, Callum, they are more concerned with price tag and reputation uh, rather than work rate, character, and previous. Oh, he's uh, worth forty-five million quid. He must be amazing. Thomas Party was a completely unnecessary buy. Completely unnecessary. I had people telling me, "Oh, Thomas Party, we haven't had a player like him since Vieira." Well, no, because you can't fight, go, you can't go out and find another Patrick Vieira. Arsenal also have at the moment Thomas Partey, Aubameyang, William, Lacazette, and Ozil for at least until the end of the season, earning in excess of one and a half million pounds a week on the wage bill. One of them doesn't even play. One of mm. them come on as a sub. One of them is injured, and. Thomas Partey is on 260 grand a week. And if you look at your history, Thomas Partey, before Atletico, played for Real Mallorca. Uh, I watched him play in the U- uh, UEFA Super Cup final in Tallinn in 2018. And he is a physical specimen, extremely, extremely strong. But, you know, I advocated at the start of the summer that Arsenal need to... Um, Need to go for the youth setup with a fine tooth comb, but no, we didn't do that. We now spent thirty million euros on Gabriel, who before signing for a Lille played for Dynamo Zagreb and Twa. Oh, James, uh, can I just come in there? There is yep. a comment coming in about a Scottish manager potentially next. Um, yeah. One of the one of the, the 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 men that have been mentioned is Steve Clark. Steve Clark has taken Scotland to the Euros. Do you think Steve Clark would consider swapping Scotland for Celtic? Uh, no, no. I think he they work so hard to get to that tournament. Uh, he's got to see it through, and he needs to look no further than Ronald Koeman. Koeman left the Dutch national side for Barcelona, and now he won't finish the season, as I, as I said on our European football show. I think Koeman will be sacked in February. And, um, you know, the Dutch national team will be going to the Euros. And I think, um, yeah, they they all work so hard, you know, to, to, to get to the Euros. You've got to enjoy it. You've got to take, you've got to take these, um, you've got to take these experiences when they come. Do you remember Laurie Sanchez when he was manager of Northern Ireland? And they were on the cusp of qualifying for the Euros, completely on the cusp. And um, he went to Fulham. And then the, the qualifying campaign kind of um, slips away. But if he just stayed as manager of Northern Ireland, they may well have qualified. So you have to see things through to the end. Well, I suppose that's that's a fair point. I want to um, ask you about two Celtic players from the past in particular. Um, so I'm sure that the comments, the guys coming in, will be up for a laugh when we mention when I mentioned these two players. Um, Dirk Borichter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Edson Braffide, two guys who came to Celtic. Braffide amazingly went on to play in a World Cup final, which stunned every every mm. single fan of Celtic. But I mean, every single fan was stunned by that. And Dirk Berichter came in for around £3 million from Ajax, was touted as being a player that 
that would make a difference. And in the end, he spent far more time in the treatment room than he did on the park. To, to start with, James, start me on Braffide because I'm assuming the comments that will come in here, that there's not a Celtic fan that has pleasant memories about his time at the club. He was, he was a, a strange, strange person. Well, if you look at his career, uh, FC Twente, FC Utrecht, he's now playing in the United States for Austin, Austin Bold, I believe. You know, nobody expected him to play in a, cup, in a World Cup final, but he did. And, um, you know, just goes to show that you never know what's going to happen in a career. You, you never know what's going to happen in a career. And, um, you know, to play in that World Cup final, I mean, that's what... Um, you know, ten ten and a half years ago now, and the the scars are still visible for the national team in that respect because it was the third time unlucky. And in the case of Borichter, he um, yeah, obviously when you when you when you play for Ekaseva Alvag, and when you you know play for Swalla, and then obviously for Ajax, and then um, and then going to the biggest club in Celtic, it's a, in in Celtic in Scotland, it can be a little bit of a culture shock. And um, I think, I think obviously his, his injury record didn't help, but also the the level of expectation as well. Some people can handle it, and some people can't, unfortunately. Well, he was one that certainly didn't have to handle it. That's 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 fair to say. Um, in terms of uh, Bo Richter, what was your opinion of him when he was over there in the Netherlands? Because when he came to, to Celtic, there was a bit of expectation. His debut was against Ross County. But he was he just wasn't good enough at Celtic in the end. Injuries though were probably the big reason behind that. Yeah, and also the the level. I mean, Ajax is is the biggest club in the Netherlands, bar none. You know, this club this club is literally an institution. Is is what it is, and I just think that. Um, I mean, he was well he was well prepared in terms of experience, but I of Ajax, but the level up. Of going to Celtic in terms of, uh, um, you know, the, um, going to a different country, you know, going to play in a different league. I mean, as I said earlier on in the, sh- in the show, you've got people that like to um, kind of um, do away with the other leagues and say, oh, it's, they're, they're useless, they're rubbish. It's simply not as simple as that. As I said to you earlier, to the mental strength you need to play for an Ajax and a Celtic is absolutely massive. You know, you literally have to win every single game you play and then you have to win it in style. So it's not just simply the, simply the case of um, of winning the game. You've got to win it with a bit of panache as well. And I just think, um, I think the timing was a little bit out of kilter for him. But, um, you know, he'll, he'll look back on a great experience. And also, Bedalfad went on to play for Lazio. You know, and you, as I say, you never know in a career, you know, who's looking, you never know who's going to come in for you. So, um, yeah, very interesting with those two players in particular. We've got um, just eight minutes left, so let's spend the, these eight minutes talking about today. Um, as I say, for the people in the comments, James and I were brought in to talk about the Dutch connections at Celtic today. James, of course, as a, as a Dutch football expert. Um, but we will spend our last uh, 10 minutes talking about today. Um, and the next show, I'm sure, we'll be covering that in detail. In terms of the achievement today, I mean, if I just sum it up from my point of view, I thought in the first half Celtic were absolutely fantastic. I thought in the first half um, the tempo was good. Ryan Christie's goal was was absolutely, absolutely sublime. And for me, Celtic were cruising in the first half. Um, Hearts midfielders, particularly Andy Halliday, was was getting wound up. He was diving into silly tackles and Celtic were in were in full command. The the second half for me, and I'm sure you may agree in the comments, was was um was deeply, deeply worrying. And it just wasn't it wasn't it wasn't good enough. And for me, the when Hearts and Boyce scored right after half time, it was just ominous. I mean when Celtic came out after half time, I think most people would agree when you're 2 0 up, you get that next goal and you probably seal the game. But when Boy scored, it was it was really it was really, really uh, poor. And and from there hearts grew into the game. Extra time again, similar story. Um Lee Griffiths scored the goal. Um and you think that it's written in the script that uh, a Hibs fan is going to score the goal that downs hearts and seals the quadruple treble. It wasn't to be, and it goes to penalties. But um, one of the things that James today that's, that, that that is really intriguing is the goalkeeper today for Celtic was was Connor Hazard. He is a young goalkeeper. He's Northern Irish, and he is he's a player that 
that was on loan at Dundee last season. And if you asked most elements of the Celtic support, probably all, I don't think anyone, even Connor himself, would have expected to be to be playing for Celtic these last few games, never mind in a Scottish Cup final. He made an error for Hearts third goal, and it was it was let's be honest with you, it was a mistake. There's 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 no other other way to put it. But to be fair, he made up for it in penalties and, and the celebrations tonight for him and so many others will be will will be incredible. Neil Lennon after the game, um, I'm seeing in the comments is, is apparently I've not had the chance to see it yet, so forgive me if this is wrong. Said that he thanks the um, Celtic board, Peter Law, Dermot Desmond, for sticking by him during the club's tough spell. Um, we've talked about potentially a long term change. We've also talked about how this could be a catalyst for 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 Celtic going forward. Charles, I agree, leave the manager alone, but it is a talking point, and that's why we're covering it. Um, so it'll be interesting to to see what happens longer term. Now, James, the last question I've got for you is a question that has come in from AGSC Technology Videos. And their question is it's quite straightforward. Now, think about the Celtic budget when you answer this question, James, of course. But um, which players playing in the Eredivisie would James recommend that Celtic sign? Are there any gems out there that Celtic could afford? Uh, well, there's two in particular which I think are feasible. Uh, first and foremost, they both play for the same club. I'll try to maybe think of a third one as well to mix it up a little bit. Um, Arsene Alakma are really, really bearing fruit with their youth policy. And, um, you know, they reinvested in their training ground. They really uh, helped with the with the young youth players. And there's two in particular they've, they've created. Uh, you know, if they want regular football... And they want to go to a league and and get themselves in a position to uh, to grow as a footballer and play every game rather than being on the bench. Um, I think you've got to look at Calvin Stengs and Tony Cole Maynard. Uh, both play for Arsenal Alakmar. Calvin Stengs has done ever so well to come back from a young uh, for, as a young player to come back from such a horrible knee injury. Which and position he, does he play in? He's a winger. He's a winger, and he's also got himself into the, into the Dutch national team set up. And um, he's uh, he's doing it very very well. And also Tom Copeminus, who's the captain of our set, a tremendous dead dead ball specialist. You know, got got already got a record as a penalty killer. In terms of you know, I remember seeing an interview with him when he played for the Dutch youth side against Portugal, and he scored a penalty. And he said, uh, the reporter said, "How do you do what you do in terms of penalties?" He said, well, I just put the ball on the spot, I turn around, I make my mind up and I whack it as hard as I can. And, you know, he's got a great attitude as well. You know, to captain, I said, it's, 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 no mean, um, it's no mean feat. So I think those two in particular, and people might say, oh, they would never go to Celtic. Yes, they would, because they real- those two players in particular realise that it's very important for, um, it's very important for, um, for young players to play in particular. You know, it's very important to, for them to kind of continue their development and not necessarily end up on the bench. I mean, we, we've spoken about Donny van der Beek on the bench yet again tonight. You know, this time last Can I just season, quickly interrupt, James? Um, £20,154 has been raised, Jimbo. Absolutely fantastic. We're delighted with that. Sorry, James, continue on. No, congratulations, first and foremost. Hopefully our chats have also... Uh, I've also uh, helped the people to think, well, we'll dig a little bit deep due to the quality. So uh, let's hope so. But yeah, in the case of Van Beek tonight, um, I think to myself, you know, he was captain in Ajax this time last year, you know, and uh, and now he's on the bench at Manchester United. And it just goes to show how quickly things can change. So I would I would say about um, uh, Calvin Stengs and Tone Coldman, is another player who I've rated for years. And although he's, he's recently signed for Feyenoord, Feyenoord are in a little bit of a um, a bit of upheaval in terms of a new manager coming in next season. It's a player called Brian Linton. And he's an absolutely tremendous footballer, a really, really good footballer. And I wonder if, if he's surplus to requirements uh, by Feyenoord, um, Celtic could do a lot worse in, in getting him on board. He, he's not the youngest, but he has tremendous quality. And, you know, just because, I mean, he's only, he came up the, the hard way, you know, playing for Venlo and uh, Groningen and Heracles and, you know, signing for Vitesse, captain Vitesse as well. And then, you know, he's made 
so so many goals, so many assists. And if he is deemed surplus to requirements at Feyenoord this summer, having only just signed for the club, I might add, uh, I, I think it's unlikely, but I think it's a name Celtic should really be marking down because I think he'd jump at the chance to play abroad for the first time at such a big club. Absolutely. Now, we are about to wrap up. Just before we go, um, it's an incredible day for Celtic, a quadruple treble. I am going to to have a few beers tonight, it's safe to say. Just before I go, um, to tee up for the next show, I just want to mention the starting 11 I hope to see going forward for Celtic. I think, I think Hazard will start uh, in goal in the next game. I think he'll keep him in. Um, I've just seen that comment from Philip DeMarco about the De Boers. Um, <laughs> oh, brilliant, Philip. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, right back, I think Christopher Iyer is doing well there. I think Neil Lennon will will um, stay with um, Julien and Duffy at left back. I would like to see Laxall come back in. I like McGregor in the deeper role. I also like Saul and Turnbull playing together. If Mikey Johnson's fit, I'd like to see him get a run of games. Um I actually think I would give Griffiths a start in the next game, if I'm honest with you. He, he took his goal well today. He looks a wee bit sharper. Um, and on the right-hand side, um, you, you may see Elianusi play again. Um, or you may even see Frimpong being pushed further forward. But um, James, from James and myself, we're, we're just about to wrap up here. You can check out uh, Football CFB. I host Football CFB. Guests that might interest you this year. Uh, Henrik Larson's been on the show, as has John Hartson, uh, Chris Sutton. Um, I've also had Packy Boner in the show. I have had um, so many more uh, former Celts on the show, hoping to get a current sell on the show in the new year. But I need to keep that close to my chest for the time being. But from James and myself, it's been an absolute joy sharing this hour with you. I know it's not maybe not been the party that you expected um, with with ourselves, but we we were brought in to, to talk about the Dutch connections at Celtic. I am absolutely delighted for the club. It's an incredible piece of history. I hope everyone enjoys their evening. I hope you've enjoyed our chat for this hour. I hope we've given you some insight into potential player Celtic could sign. We went down memory lane by talking about Vim Janssen, someone we remember fondly and maybe a couple that we don't remember as fondly. But from James and myself, thank you so much for your your time. And just before we go, just to say that we're approaching £21,000 and I want to put on record my thanks to Paul John Dykes for having me on the show. And I also want to say a thank you to everyone listening to this and everyone that's donated. The charities that a Celtic state of mind is following are absolutely, absolutely incredible. They do incredible work and the, the achievement to bring all these people together is, is, is Paul's. He deserves immense credit and so do you for donating. Thank you so much for your time today and hail, hail.